Hello everybody, this is again Pascal and I would like to talk with you today again about one of these foreign affairs articles, another neocon lunatic fantasy that needs a bit of attention because again it gives insight into the the workings of how these people conceive the world, how they frame the world, and also the networks that allow them then to wreak this much havoc as we are seeing currently in already uh, two places around the world where hot wars, hot neocon inspired, neocon involved wars are going on. And uh, look at this, they're thinking of uh, making the case of how to sustain a third one, you know, at the same time, these people are proactively thinking about um, making world war, right? I mean, if you if you add enough of these theaters, theaters, then the uh, we will be engulfed in it completely and it it shows again like also the, the language that they use a three theater defense strategy that they really think of this more of like an act more of more of a, a, a maybe either a video game or a movie a lot of this thinking just is is like playing playing a board game as jeffrey Sachs says it's like playing risk and these people conceive of it like that but Foreign Affairs is, of course, one of the most important neocon outlets uh, out there. And Foreign Affairs occasionally carries okay uh, fine analysis, but really only occasionally. I mean, usually it's really all about this stuff, you know, how America can win the coming battery war. Everything is a war now. Batteries are a war now. Um, Hamas has reinvented underground warfare. And here, look at this, the axis of upheaval. In the new, uh, in the latest issue, in the print issue that 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 they published, how America's adversaries are uniting to overturn the global order. It, this is it's just insane how they conceive of the world as anything that is not under their immediate control as something that is a rebellion against order, and the uh, and the order can only be brought by definition through U.S. military force and well this are this article here um, goes in exactly that that direction arguing that oh no you know what we have what we have to do is not to de-escalate and try to to um to create a peaceful world or a world a stable world right Be with with these different power centers the the point is we have to defeat them we have to defeat um anyone and anything that dares to have a different a different way of wanting to go in another way and not wanting to break apart russia and not wanting to dismember china and so on if that's the idea then you have nothing i mean you have no legitimacy on this planet that's the neocon the neocon thing now they are making very strongly the case for um well more engagement and with engagement they always mean like more war um the first the first sentence i want to point out is this one the united states is currently involved in two wars ukraine Ukraine's in Europe and Israel's in the Middle East, while facing the prospect of a third over Taiwan or South Korea in East Asia. All three theaters are vital to US interests, and they are all intertwined. What these people never do is explain why this is vital. Why is it vital for the United States who governs four provinces in eastern Ukraine or in, 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 East, in, Eastern, in eastern Europe? Um, why is that pivotal to US security? That's never, that's never um, explained. The only thing is that's claimed is that it is, it is a fact. You know, we need to run this and we need to, we need to define how the, the world is, uh, is ordered. And it continues. A failure to respond to aggression in one theater can be interpreted as a sign of American weakness. So <laughs> this is this is up, it's absolute warmongering, right? Um, you need to establish dominance everywhere. If even in one place you show a little bit of weakness, then everything else is going to crumble. And of course, we know that over the past 50, 60 years, there have been time and again um, extreme U.S. reversals of previous policies. Right? The, the what happened in Vietnam, um, how the Afghanistan war ended after 20 years with a U.S. defeat, and all of these defeats before they happened, they were portrayed as that would 
would be the greatest catastrophe in the world and um, the United States would probably be immediately attacked and, and, and be seized by its enemies, you know, the domino effect. And it never once happened. But they keep recycling this talking point that you need to stand stand up for liberty and freedom and whatever this, the stupid slogan of, of the day is in that foreign theater. That foreign theater is the place we need to make a stance, a last stance, because after this one, it's going to be San Francisco. Um, has been like this for the last 80 years, and it just, the narrative continues. Um, the article continues. Washington is fortunate to have capable allies and friends in East Asia, Europe and the Middle East. Collectively, they have the power to help it constrain the authoritarian axis. An authoritarian axis, I mind you. Um, but to succeed, they must do a better job of working together. Washington and its allies need to be what military planners call interoperable. And I assure you, interoperability is the hype at the moment in in all of this security environment the even the swiss are talking about interoperability and how they wish to be more interoperable with nato in order to be more useful as a nato dog for for the nato war games even the swiss are caught by this by this mental insanity and of course the the nato members are and in japan interoperability is also this huge huge issue which is one thing and one thing only making it easier easier for the united states to deploy its partners um, or satellite states and, and, and other militaries, right, the, the, to, to control them directly or, or more efficiently. Um, <laughs> the framing is just absolutely fantastic. Under the heading Putting Friends First, we read in the article that the first effort uh, the United States and its allies must step up is it's defense production. What a big surprise. The article calls for the US government should provide defense companies with the kind of steady demand needed to boost production. Um, Washington, the article says, must also get better at creating a seamless distribution process for weapons, that is. And it will probably not uh, surprise you that this Thomas G. Mankin um, is actually the director of a US think tank, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, um, which in turn actually boosts a post on its um, web page about the fact that it gets uh, grants from all of these wonderful um, uh, public inst and private institutions, one of them being, for instance, Lockheed Martin. What a surprise that a think tank uh, chief who gets money from Lockheed Martin then writes articles saying how important it is to invest more money into Lockheed Martin and to make sure that there's a, st a steady stream of money going. Um, these people are shameless, shameless. And the politicians and the thinkers, I mean, this guy, I, I, I don't think I should call him a thinker. This is a warmongering maniac who wants more people killed and who demands in his article literally just a, st a steady flow, a steady stream of money to the military industrial complex in, in order to make sure that we have more of these implements of war with which we can kill more people. Of course, these, these lunatics and absolute despicable monsters, they always frame it as defense. The way you defend the United States, the continental United States and Hawaii and so on, you know, the way you do that is by fighting a war in the Middle East and by killing more Russians in Ukraine. That is their concept of defense and they want a third one, right? They want to add uh, a, a, a war in and about Taiwan to the to the collection. That's that's their idea, and it's all all framed as defense. When in when in actuality, it is nothing else but blood lustern offensive uh, wars of, uh, of useless aggression. And I <laughs> I get really emotional about this because I find it horrible the way that this that this framing is being done, and that a lot of people take this serious. They read these articles and they go like, "Oh yes, this is a serious thinker. This is a real problem. We really need to uh, figure out how to produce more weapons." This influences an entire group class gr uh, of elites who then who who then produce these these um these policies at the end of the day and um the jake sullivan's of the world then use this as as talking points and this dis discussions in or in, in in the political realm in order to push for more of these policies this is an elite group right in the us a highly um belligerent um political group 
Uh, what I find interesting is how they want to use their allies, right? And they always call them allies, but by this point it's pretty clear they just keep pushing anyone they have into their wars. And um, I do hope, I do hope Japan and Korea and Taiwan are not gonna uh, are not gonna play along with this and 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 move independently, um, or at least more independently than the Europeans who are so captured that they would be willing at the moment to go into a nuclear war and have new, have Europe destroyed. Um, rather than disappoint uh, the Uncle Sam, and and but okay, let's get back to the to the actual article, who, which the, keeps uh, keeps saying that the United States possesses an unparalleled network of uh, military bases. Yes, yes, U.S. You are the largest country on earth in terms of military size. Nobody is even close, even close. I mean, the next ten countries together are not as close as uh, are spending less on their military because you have like these uh, seven eight nine hundred maybe one thousand foreign bases you have a huge network of foreign bases right united states um so what why is it that this is not enough but all these bases have become more vulnerable as adversaries have acquired the ability to strike with precision over great distances oh well, the, the the thing is this: like um, all of these bases are over uh, everywhere in the world, and they they intervene everywhere in the world. And if somebody isn't isn't happy about that and tries to do something against this, then that's an attack on the U.S. Right? That's the thing. They, the U.S. These people constantly create this narrative that the U.S. is under attack when when people are unhappy with their bases being somewhere in the Middle East. Um, in recent years, the U.S. Air Force has therefore developed what it calls agile combat. Em uh, employment. This strategy entails operating combat aircraft from dispersed bases so they can't be easily targeted. All right, uh, smart strategy. If you want to attack Iran, don't attack from one single base. Um, create a lot of bases and then att attack from from all of these bases. Right, that makes it much harder to um, to strike the, um, the the um, the the airplanes and all of the other uh, weaponry. And now comes what they what they are dreaming about for for how to fight China. In the West Pacific, Japan offers some promising locations for dispersed operations. The country has many ports, airfields, and support facilities that are tied into the Japanese road and rail network, but existing arrangements restrict Japan's military to a small fraction of these facilities, and US forces are restricted to an even smaller portion. Oh, damn it! No, we cannot deploy our US troops and our US military um, equipment that we want to use to strike China all over Japan the way we want because it would be much better and much safer you know the china would have to strike as much uh, it would be much, it would be much more difficult and they would have to strike all over japan in order to destroy it and that's what we want we want to make japan as vulnerable as possible and we want to control uh, we want to have our 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 little pieces and our 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 aircrafts everywhere in japan and there and you can see how he's frustrated that that's not an actuality yet because the bases that the us has in japan are actually geographic confined and they are in fact a huge issue over here um, and the people who live in the vicinity of these uh, of these horrible places they don't like them at all they want them to be gone the Okinawa has been fighting for 50 60 years to get rid of that uh, goddamn US military base in Okinawa um, haven't succeeded but they these people don't like them and this is the kind of people who say like look we need more of those and they need to be more distributed and probably preferably uh, close to population centers so that uh, you know any attack against them would could automatically then be framed as an attack against civilians uh, in case of war right uh, the article continues uh, the United States should encourage the Japanese government to expand both military's access to military useful airfields and ports rather than largely restricting it to designated US bases. I seriously, seriously hope the Japanese are going to be smart enough not to do that and not to place in every uh, Japanese port and every Japanese airfield uh, US um, military uh, equipment which which if the US goes to war with China will be used and will be fair game and will make Japan immediately a target of attack right um if China needs to do 
if China decides to strike these assets. This is, uh, this is of course, uh, a recipe for disaster. I hope and I believe the Japanese won't do that because I believe that they actually see it because they are not as um, as happy about this escal escalatory process and they have been trying to de-escalate with China, especially on, on by using trade routes and, and by negotiating more trade with them as opposed to what the United States is doing. In the meantime, the United States may be able to rotate more troops through northern Australia. Australia is far enough away from China to be safe from most Chinese air and missile threats, but still close enough to conduct and support operations in future conflict in the Western Pacific. It's like, okay, another country that they just want to use. It's just This is just a, pl a place to put my, my, my chess pieces and from where I'm then going to play, and I'm not going to care about whether this is good for Australia or not. I'm just going to say this is great because we're going to help you the way we helped Ukraine, right? Because I guess every country on earth would like to be the next Ukraine. I mean, I hope people are intelligent enough to understand that you don't want to be Ukraine. Ukraine got the worst deal in the effing world. And I hope, I just hope countries and, and decision makers in Japan and Australia and the Philippines and, and Taiwan understand that this is a US strategy to transform other countries into the next Ukraine, into the next Afghanistan and fight these proxy wars through them. And this needs to be stopped. I mean, this is just this is this is just the US recipe for how to fight the next proxy war and with whom. Um, the article also says by training and operating more closely with one uh, another in with one another in peacetime, U.S. and allied forces will develop habits to cooperation that will serve them well in wartime. So they are preparing. They are preparing this. Allies may be able to strike deals, for example, that will allow them to quickly surge forces and resources to bases across theaters as needed to deter threats or respond to aggression. It's, like, it's all about how to how to use these military capabilities more efficiently. And, you know, it gets so bad that under the under the heading sharing is caring, they, they, they use that term. They say that the West will also need to do a better job um, of coming up with shared concepts and strategies. Washington must have frank conversations with its allies to help clarify assumptions about objectives, strategies, roles and missions and yield a better understanding of how to best work collectively. And by this, he, of course, means the US needs to be more assertive in how it talks to the allies in order to make sure the allies also line up and they don't they don't oppose any of this warmongering and that the that everybody follows exactly the the lead of the United States, because these people, these neocons think that they are the only ones who ever understood how world politics works. And well, it basically works through military beans. Therefore, everybody needs to agree to to put their military uh, assets at, at the disposal of the United States. And that's why you need frank, frank and, and, and difficult conversations. For example, the article says uh, the United States and key allies such as Australia, Japan and the Philippines must figure out how to work together to meet the threat of Chinese aggression against Taiwan. So again, um, a neocon in Washington telling three countries that they need to figure out how to how to be more useful to the US in order to uh, fight its war with China. Um, this is this is pretty sad and scary. I again, uh, I I hope at some point these these warmongering maniacs, uh, uh, blood lusty, bloodthirsty um, scum of the earth will be seen as the scum of the earth that they are. Because really, like pretending that in, that these people in suits and neckties are actually serious thinkers and have like real value to give when all they call for is more bloodshed is a recipe to absolute disaster. These people they need to be unmasked, they need to be seen for what they are, and they need to be opposed, opposed on every every level that still is sane. Because otherwise, I kid you not, in Europe, we are on the way to a nuclear war. And in, in Asia Pacific, if we are not careful, we might be on the way to turning uh, Taiwan, maybe Japan into the next Ukraine. If people like this piece of work uh, get their way and we must do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you for listening to my rant. All the best. <laughs>